active ministry here going on we on Sunday mornings. We have two services Sunday mornings. We invite you to come. And it's interesting that we have some of the folks that drive almost two hours one way to church week after week after week. That's pretty amazing, right? And others that drive, uh, you know, an hour and a half one way. So when this message grips your heart, when you see something in this message, they, you hear on the radio and they say, well, what they say is they say, well, the Lord's Day is coming up kind of thing. And so they are talking Sunday and they say, well, you know, so go to, the, go to the local church of your choice. And you've heard me say before, no, don't go to the local church of your choice. Go, go to the church of God's choice. The church of God's choice is a local assembly that is committed to preaching and teaching the Word of God rightly divided out of the King James Bible. That's the work, that's the local church of God's choice. All right. So that's what we're committed to. Same with uh, Pastor Jordan, his ministry here, Dave, their ministry here, Eric's ministry, and so forth, and others that hear from different parts of the country that uh, meet with saints that have come to see and appreciate some things about God's grace and want to continue to grow in that. So we invite you to be a part of that. There are a number of conferences coming up throughout the year. Brother Jordan mentioned last night, he's every, every month he's somewhere in the United States and other, like Canada as well, uh, conferences up there. So some of the saints from Sacramento, they had to get on the road uh, before this message, but they asked if I could just repeat one more time. The Sacramento conference is going to be June 24th through 26th. If you're interested in receiving the updates on that conference, then you be sure to either uh, contact me or, and I'll give you Paula's email. She really is going to be the person to, to contact on this. But just let me know if you want more information about that. The women's uh, Bible study, once again, uh, April, you're kind of coordinating that. Correct. You're, you're heading up uh, that one. There's the Sacramento Women's Conference, April 29th through May 1st, up in Sun River, Oregon. And again, I have to laugh at that. I didn't know there was such a place. Sun River, <laughs> Sun, Sun River, Oregon. That's where we get the sun. Yeah, that's where <laughs> And then Grace Life Northwest Springs Con uh, Spring Conference, and that is uh, March 19th through 20th. Dave will be up there, and Adrian as well. So uh, very capable men preaching and teaching the Word of God. It is indeed uh, pretty cool to see all the men that are capable, able, and willing to preach and to teach the Word of God in various areas. And, and uh, so we very much appreciate that. So keep the various conferences in mind. Um, we started several months ago a new Bible study on Tuesday nights uh, up maybe maybe 10 miles up the road there in the Lake Forest area. And what we're going to do is this week, instead of having it on Tuesday night, we're shifting it to tomorrow night. Brother Jordan and, and Mrs. Jordan are in town. And so he's going to teach that class, and it's right up the road of Lake Forest. If you are in town and if you want to come to that class, it's 7 o'clock uh, tomorrow night. Today is Sunday, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that's seven o'clock tomorrow night. We are going to have a meal there as well. We're going to go order stuff from Panera Bread, and then we'll have food there. So if you are going to come to that, and if you've not attended before, please be sure to let me know so I can get a proper head count for the food. And we'll start at seven o'clock. Plus, I'll need to give you the directions or the address. You can just GPS it and so forth. Everyone except Lonnie. Um, <laughs> I know about that, right? Uh, so Shai will give him the directions for the house. I asked him about that, okay? <laughs> it was kind of a funny story. But, uh, right, Lon? Yes, no? <laughs> okay, anyway. Yeah. So, but, uh, so we should have a lot of fun on, on Tuesday night for that study. We have really had yeah. a lot of fun at that, that. On Monday night, thank you. But we've had a really fun time there at that study and everything. So, okay. Um, if you would like to support the financial commitment to this conference here this weekend and so forth the way to do that there is an offering box in the back and some of y'all have asked who to make the check out to it's a Berean Bible ministry and then others who might be interested in just making a deposit or a, a, a contribution by way of credit card then Anne Marie has that little thing called the square men nothing like modern technology right she's got it right there on the phone and everything and so she says she would be right outside the door after conference and it's not going to let you leave until I mean I'm not <laughs> And by the way, Tyler, you're the one that actually mentioned that to me a couple weeks ago, so thank you for Richard doing that. Richard Jordan had Square four years ago and told me I should get it for my school. Yeah. So I'm, I cannot take credit for that. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> and we, I mean, we're just guy. not coming into the He knows how to get money. money. We're going to get money. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that very much. And by the way, since I mentioned Anne Marie, once again, thank you, Anne Marie, for all the hard work. I don't have my name tag on everything, but you know, you guys don't know who my precious grandbaby is, do you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I 
so she helped she helped make those little things and when I was wearing it the other day she was just so impressed like, oh so I made that she is so cute you see Sally Masters did a lot of Yes, where is Sally? Because I'm telling you, Sally Masters did a lot of work. The last three years in a row, Sally's been the one coordinator of all this, and somehow she tripped, I mean, convinced me, and we doing this. I'm in sales, don't forget. She's in sales. <laughs> yeah, so but thank you as well for all the help. And, and uh, Mike, is that what you're saying? No, bagel shop. That's right, yeah, that is on my list, so thank you. What, what they mentioned is that uh, the bagel shop, which is right down the road there, they have been very generous in providing snacks and stuff like that, I think at a pretty big discount as well. What uh, Sally just told me, by the way, is that she was talking to, I guess, the owner? It's on YouTube. Okay, so ask her about that. There's some good news about that relative to the message and why there was an interest in this message. Uh, and, and so that's kind of cool. Turn it around. Yeah. So at any rate, so that was kind of cool. So we need to come up with that. But at any rate, the fact that they um, gave us a big discount, the um, the bagels and that type of thing, that's huge. So uh, okay, are we good? Hold on just a second. Are we good? All right, okay, yes. Yes. Do they want us to turn you Great question. Name tags, will they turn it back in at the end? Sure. Okay. That'd be very helpful, especially since you're all coming back, plus <laughs> more, so she'll have the name tags again for next year. There you go. That's awesome. Okay, uh, let's see. Any other quick um, announcements here? Does anybody have any quick questions? Long questions are not accepted at this point. Okay. I think that's it. So once again, you know, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you to Anne Marie. Thank you for all the teachers that helped with the kids' classes uh, in the nursery. Uh, the, uh, Rich and, and Nathan who did the teens. I understand they're really great time with the teens and everything. And boy, thanks to our musicians, the folks stepping up this morning. Having said that, I believe we have one more song, and right after the song, Brother Jordan will come up for the final concluding message for this uh, this afternoon. We're going to sing number 20. We'll need to stand up for this one. Amen. Yeah. Johnson, you out again, right? <laughs> yeah, I need to mention that uh, it really has been a blessing to have these two young gentlemen here uh, yes. sharing sharing their talents with us all, all weekend. Yes, and and uh, I sure hope uh, and look forward to having you guys back out next, next year. All right, number 20, My Anchor Holds. <laughs>
<laughs> With a song like that, you need Scripture James to lead it. <laughs> What's this show? <laughs> Take the Bible through with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians 5. There is a, on the table over here our, our material, there's, there's a bookmark that we put out for the, the two meetings we hold back in Chicago in April. We have a school meeting. If you're a part of Grace School of Bible, we have a meeting the last school weekend in April of every year. Find the last Sunday in April. It's that weekend. And it's... Uh, well, we, we hold it at Shore Bible Church in Rolling Meadows, which is a suburb of Chicago. And uh, if, you'll cut, if you'll get yourself there, get you a ticket there at home, we'll, we'll put you up Friday night and Saturday night, buy your hotel room, and feed you during the day on Saturday so you don't starve. And uh, get you back to the airport Sunday to send you home, okay? But it's a, it's a ministry-type weekend. It's for our students and graduates of the school, anybody interested in the work of the ministry. It's not a Bible conference like this, where it's just kind of a general thing, but this is, these are for the, for, the, for the work of the ministry. I would encourage you, if you're involved in the ministry, to think about coming. If you have a class where you have leaders, I'd encourage you to think about sending your leaders, because it's the kind of thing that um, you guys come, we've been doing this since the 80s, and um, it's kind of an encouragement, kind of a weekend for the men in the ministry, and, and kind of an opportunity for them to fellowship around things together. Uh, you get a bunch of preachers together and, and leaders and ministry together and there are certain things you just notice that's always the same <laughs> and discouragement <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, that kind of thing and uh, you, I, you know Spurgeon said that in Timothy and Titus when Paul wrote to Timothy and the church he said grace be to you and peace from God our Father when he wrote to Timothy and Titus he said grace mercy and peace be to you and that's because pastors had to deal with people and they need a lot of mercy when they did that and uh, anyway that, that's a meeting you're, you're all welcome to come but I, I, I encourage you about that and then um, in July we have a conference a week long conference and I, I think I said yesterday we had 26 different speakers that week and everybody just gets to preach one time and we, only about half the guys that will be there that can preach that are preaching have you know we don't we can't take two weeks to have a meeting I and mean, I would but it, it's not something that's practical and uh, those kind of conferences that's that's our our, our meeting in, in, in the summertime and if you want to come back to Chicago and visit the Mid Midwest Chicago is a wonderful place to visit there's so many things to see and do there uh, along with the Bible conference uh, we, we meet at 9 o'clock 10 o'clock 11 o'clock in the morning you have the afternoon open until 4 o'clock have a session at 4 then another one at 7 so we have a lot of Bible every day and it's a program for your whole family, from children, nursery, all, all the way up through the children, uh, uh, through, the, through the high school, and uh, activities for the adults too. So there's something going on for the whole family all the time. If you, you see these children up here, if you, if you under, can understand when you have children, what you put into them, they carry with them forever. As a man in our assembly, his mother was, uh, she's old, elderly now, and she has dementia. And uh, she hardly recognizes her family. But she was raised in Nazi Germany. And she still, she gets up every morning reciting the slogans, we hate the Jews, we do this stuff, that they taught her in the war. She was an orphan. She was raised in a Nazi orphanage. And she gets up every morning now. And she's saved. She loves the Lord. She's lived for the Lord. She raised her family uh, in, in our church. and she. But now she, that she's lost her you know, her cognizance, cognizance of what's going on with the dementia, but what she had as a child is still there. Can I tell you, sometime when you're raising your children, I've raised three kids and I'm, I'm to, to adulthood, and watched and raising, we got nine grandkids, and our ministry, we have, our, we have a ministry with, with, with uh, 50 or 60 children in the Sunday school, in the young children kind of thing. And I, 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 I've had all through the years a philosophy of, of children's work. If they'll sit still long enough for you to put a verse in that mush between their ears, put it in there. Because it'll stick. And it'll stay. And it's, if, if you can keep that stuff, the crazy stuff, all those years, you can keep the Word of God. And the more, the more verses they have in their mind, the more material the Holy Spirit has to use in their mind. It's going to work through that. And a sad thing in our day when people don't have very much of the Scripture in their understanding. You live in a day when our culture 
doesn't even understand the metaphors that carry the values of our culture. I said for some time now, several years ago, I met a lawyer in Chicago, a 30-year-old guy, graduate of a big law school, prestigious university, big law firm in downtown Chicago. We're at the airport, we're talking. He's 30 years old fellow. He didn't, we got talking about the Good Samaritan Law. He didn't know where the title Good Samaritan came from. <laughs> How can you be properly educated in Western history and not know what the Good Samaritan is? <laughs> when I told him it came out of the Bible and the story that Jesus told, he said, no, that can't be. <laughs> I said, why can't it be? He said, separation of church and state can't be. <laughs> That's how stupid people can be. When I say stupid, I mean ignorant. What? I'm getting another picture of the There you go. Yeah, he's getting. I, I forgot to turn him on. I don't want to do that to them. Sorry about that. But the the um, it's not that young man's fault personally in the city, people, people just didn't educate in things that produce the culture that we've enjoyed. If you wonder why the culture we've enjoyed is going away, listen, a culture is a reflection of the thinking of people. And when you don't have those things in your mind, then don't expect the culture to carry the things that aren't in your mind. And when these children, young people, you as adults, you take God's word, you put it in your heart. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's not creeds and rites and repetitious prayers that you learn. It's the truth of God's Word in your heart. God's Word is life. And it's that life, your faith resting in His Word, gives the Spirit of God the power, the ability to take that and make it work effectually in you and become life for you. So when you do that, you invest in children, young people, you invest in the right thing that way. Put that in their mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're, we're down to the end of the, of, of the conference, and my topic to, today is that's one of these, you know, the last speaker gets to kind of send you home. So the question is, what should we do with all this information you've been learning this weekend? And, uh, you know, I thought this morning, I thought you just said, believe it and use it. <laughs> okay, let's stand for the benediction. <laughs> now you know that ain't going to happen. <laughs> You got to read the text, read the text, right? Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty. <laughs> uh, the wishful thinking. Uh, I say all that. Oh, well, we might get out early. Uh, Second Corinthians five, verse twenty. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For He has made Him to be sin for us who do no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We then as workers together with, with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Let's pray this a moment. Father, we thank you today for the privilege we have of, of knowing you, of having that personal, intimate relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. And to know that we can trust you we can know what's in your mind and in your heart because you've revealed it to us through your word. As we come here to study your word, to learn from your word, we pray that it would do its work in our hearts. And as we trust it, it work effectually in us. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Our ministry through the years has been built you know, you try to explain to people, what do you believe, what do you do, what are you about? I was being interviewed on the radio some time ago, and, and uh, they said, well, what's sure what all about? What's Grace School of Bible all about? And I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, I need to have a way to say that quickly. So some of us got together, we, we, we got to talk about it, and uh, we came up with five things that in essence encapsulize what it is we teach and what it is we're trying to do. And they're really the pillars upon which we, our ministry rests, what, what you do here rests. Not one, first one is a gospel you can believe. If you don't have a gospel, a good news that you can actually believe and trust that will get you some, that, that will accomplish something for you, that will do what the gospel is designed to do, that is just the power of God to salvation, what use is it? 
If I give you a message that says, you know, the, you know the song, Jesus paid it all, all, all the hymn I owe. There's another version I was raised with. It says, Jesus paid a part, and I a part, you know. Should have left a crimson stain, we watched it white as snow. And I was raised in a religion that, that I thought believing was doing. They had, you know, when I was, I went through catechism, did all the stuff, and answered all the questions, and got my little certificate, said I was a fit member of the kingdom of heaven, and, and my, my mom's got it, had it in the secret chest there, just in case I needed it someday. And, <laughs> You know, and I did all that stuff. I learned all, all the, the creeds and all that kind of stuff. And I was just lost as a hound dog. I was lost as a golf ball in high weeds. I was on my way to hell, and I knew it. And I knew that what I had done, all the things I did, never were going to save me because I knew I never did them enough. John said earlier, if you have to keep doing it, then it didn't work. If you have to ask for forgiveness over and over and over and over, it's because you're not getting forgiveness that lasted that did the job to start with. The gospel you can believe. The gospel is how that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. He died for your sins. You're a sinner. You got a problem. That's your problem. Your problem is you're dead in sin. You need life. So Christ dies to pay for our sin debt. The wage of sin is death. He died for it. He's resurrected to do what? Give you life. Resurrection. Death couldn't hold him. All the sins paid for. When he hung on the cross and said it's finished. It's done. He's not on the cross anymore. He's been resurrected. It's like a receipt that says paid in full. And the good news is that that message is the power of God to everyone that believes. Not believes and does something because he did all the work. When he hung on the cross, he said it's finished. You need a gospel you can believe that works. So the first thing we're interested in is preaching a message to people that can give them life, forgiveness, a home in heaven. God's life is present possession. A gospel you can believe. If you can have a gospel you can believe, you need a Bible you can trust. You need a final authority you can absolutely depend on. There are all kinds of final authorities out there in the world today. All kinds of people want you to believe this and that and the next thing. And a, a final authority, a book, a Bible, an objective authority outside of yourself that you can trust. That's why we understand the Bible version issue. The King James Bible is an issue. You want a Bible that has all the verses that ought to be in it, leaves out all the verses that shouldn't be in it. I mean, you understand that? that that's, 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 that's a big issue. And have them translated for you into your language you can understand. Third thing is a, a gospel you can believe, a Bible you can trust, a life you can live. I, 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 before you get a study you can understand. Let's don't forget that. <laughs> We're not Bible packers. My function is not just to tote a Bible around and say, I got the Bible, I got the book. I want to understand God's Word. It's the understanding of His Word that gives light. The entrance of thy Word gives light, gives understanding to the simple. <laughs> God has given a way to. Have you ever noticed the Bible's a big book? I'm a Bible teacher, I've been doing it for five decades. I learned a long time ago, I, I read, I read all the time. My wife gets frustrated with me, you're always reading. You know, there are, there, there are ways to read books. For example, if I gave you a phone book, and I said, look up my number in the phone book, would you? Would you start at page one and start reading? Yeah. No, why? Because that's not how you read a phone book. If I said, look up the word justification, gave you a dictionary, would you start a page? How many have ever read a dictionary from page one to the end? Am I the only one? That ever read? You've done it? Okay, there's two of us. Dan and I, we, years ago, I, I got a 1828 Webster's Dictionary, and I was reading through the introduction of it, and it's so fa he's so fascinated with the English language, and I'm reading it, and when I got to A, I just kept reading. Right? And, and two days later, I'd read, the whole, I'd read the whole thing. It's fascinating, but that's not the way you re use a dictionary. And you know that. Now, if I gave you a novel, I'm reading, I'm just finishing a novel right now. I read it on the plane coming out here, The Fifth Wave. The, big, the Harry Potter novel for young people today is, is the Fifth Wave novels. And so I'm reading them. And I read the thing. You know how you read a novel? Well, you start at the beginning and go to the end, right? 
I go about a third of the way through and go read the last two chapters. My wife gets mad at me. She says, that's not the way you read it. That's cheating. <laughs> but that's just right. But that's it. You read it from the beginning to the end. There's a way to read a novel. You understand that there's a way to read the Bible. There's a divinely prescribed way to read God's Word so that you can understand it and get the profit out of it that God put in it for you. It's not enough just to have it. You need to be able to study it the way God says to study it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A word that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. You need to be able to study the Word of God in a way that you can understand it so that the Bible becomes the authority in your life. Your understanding of it gives you the ability to, to, to understand and put it to work in your life. That's what that timeline's about. Understanding how to understand God's Word. How to let the Bible be a living book for you. Not something that commentaries and preachers and the church has to tell you about, but that you can understand for yourself because God designed for it to be for you to understand. Amen. A life that you can live. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The Christian life is not a performance system. The Christian life is not to put you back under the spirit of bondage again to fear. I was thinking about that yesterday. We talked about that verse in Romans 8, 17. <laughs> to make that verse a performance verse is to go right back up verse 15 and put you under that spirit of bondage again to fear. I'm afraid I'm not doing enough to get the reward kind of thing. That's not who God's made. Listen, God gave you everything He has for you in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He says, here, here's the gift. Open it up and enjoy it. And it is a life, the life of Christ. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And live, you see, Jesus Christ is the only one who can live His life. He put it in you, lives it through you. He gave His life for you at Calvary. So He could give His life to you when you trust Him. So you can live this life through you day by day as you walk by faith in an intelligent understanding of God's Word to you. And then when you do that, the fifth thing is you realize there's a purpose that you can fulfill. When God made you a member of the church, the body of Christ, He made you a part of something that He's been planning, He planned before the foundation of the world to accomplish. You're a part of a great cosmic plan that God has for His creation. And you're, an, you're, you're a part of an integral or agency to accomplish that plan and purpose. He says, We're, by grace you are saved through faith, that of yourself it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know that verse. Mm -hmm. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. Back here before the world began, he, he, he ordained the church the body of Christ, he planned to form it, and he had a purpose for that body of Christ to accomplish. Now that, that purpose has to do with some things in the future out here in the ages to come, but it has to do with things we're doing right now, too, that affect all that. Listen, you don't die and go to heaven to get eternal life. You get eternal life the moment you trust Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And that life begins to live in you, and the purpose of that life begins to function in you right now. My topic this morning is that fifth one. And what does Paul say he is in, in chapter 5, verse 20? Now then we... And that's not just Paul, that's us too. Our ambassadors for Christ. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is an official representative of a foreign government or head of state. Who's the rightful king of the universe? Lord the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is he? He's on exile. We're his ambassadors. Do you understand that in your Christian life, your Christian life is designed for you. It's not just designed for you to have a nice, sweet way to get through life and not have any problems. Ha, ha, ha. That will work out for you. You know, and you hear all that stuff, you know. You, you get saved, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be wealthy, and you're going to be wise, and you know, just don't look in the mirror. The reality is different. Religion tells you all that stuff because they got something to get from you. But the reality is God gives you life and he gives it to you for a purpose. And involved in your Christian life is not just so that you can have a, a nice, quiet, easy life. That isn't what happens. John wrote that yesterday about the sufferings and so forth. You live in a fallen creation. Verse that I always think about is 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. 
It didn't say you're doing it, it just said you got the heart's desire to do it. You know? I mean, who would ever say they're doing it? You ever, you ever hear anybody say, I'm living godly? <laughs> just remember, the closer you get to the light, the better you see the dirt. <laughs> Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Because as soon as you think you're doing it, you did the one thing that is pretty much proof you aren't doing it. But they that will live God, have a heart to live the way God wants to live. To live like God designed them to live. What does it say they're going to do? Shall. 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 Suffer. Shall. Persecution. Didn't say you're going to have great success, reward, and prosperity in the earth. It said you're going to suffer persecution. Why? This is the time of the present suffering. The glory comes out there. Okay? So when you, when you look at that and you say, wow, okay. My purpose is to be an ambassador for Christ. Why don't you come back with me to Acts chapter 20. And I want you to see Paul describe what it meant to him. You know, think about it. How do you explain what an ambassador is? Well, Paul said we're ambassadors. So look at how he describes his own life. Acts 20, his own ministry. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is he's on his way to Jerusalem. But he's going to stop by a little town called Miletus, and he's going to gather the, the, the elders from the church at Ephesus, which is just a little ways away, and he's going to have a meeting with them. So he gets the Ephesian elders together, verse number 17, Acts 20, 17, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came in, into Asia, after what manner I have been with you in all seasons. Now he's going to describe his ministry. So if you wanted to see what an ambassador does, here's a description. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. The first thing, there are four dimensions of Paul's ministry here. The first thing he talks about is his ministry in relationship to his, his to, it's serving the Lord. The first issue in his ministry has to do with what God wants him to do. And what's he doing? He's serving, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. That word serving, come with me to Romans chapter 12. That's a fascinating word. How do you serve the Lord? You know, there's all, there's all kind of talk about worshiping God, worshiping this kind of thing. Don't fall into the, words mean something. Don't fall into the trap uh, of 20th century Christianity. I don't know we're in the 21st century, but the 20th century is when this started. I, you know, I appreciate the music. I love music. You guys, I love what you, the, 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 the music and the, the um, expressions. But there's a, there's a thing, somebody you said yesterday, can talk about contemporary Christian music. You know that term? You know what contemporary Christian music is? It's the 1980s music. <laughs> and if you hadn't noticed it, the 80s is not contemporary anymore. Yeah. That's old people now. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> and they, that, that's what, when you see that, when you see that term out there, I think about structurally, and I, I don't want to get into music theory here, but structurally, what's called contemporary Christian music, I shouldn't do that. I got to it. It's in my mind. I got to get it out. <laughs> Do you know what bluegrass music is? Yeah. Bill Monroe. Okay. Uh -huh. Now you think bluegrass music means Bill Monroe developed bluegrass music in Kentucky, the bluegrass state. You probably thought that's why it's called bluegrass music, but it's not. You don't invent a genre of music because you play it in Kentucky. Bluegrass music is Kentucky folk music that reached out and take took the blue note out of jazz. You know what a blue note is? Jazz is a, a blue note is a is kind of construction in, in jazz. My wife's going Construction in jazz. And what Bill Monroe did is he took the blue note out of jazz and put it into Kentucky hillbilly music and made blue grass music. It's a different genre. It, it's constructed in a certain way. Okay? Contemporary Christian music did that. They took the, 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 the uh, construction of the way the music is, and they change the construction just up. So it's not a bad thing, it's a progressive thing, but it's a change. But what, where I was going with that to start with, 
without all that theory, <laughs> is that people now, when you have a song service in church, used to be it was your songs in worship. So now for 20 minutes, you stand up and do praise and worship. When the praise and worship is over, what do you do? But we're not worshiping anymore because we just worship. That's where you got to be careful. Words mean things. Worship is not singing. Singing can be worship, but worship is not singing. You have the preaching service. It, that's not worship anymore now. We, talk, we say in the Bible, that's not worship. You see where that gets, gets to be a problem? When he said serve the Lord, serving the Lord, service is worship. That's the point. Romans chapter 12. Here's what service is. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Service. So if you're going to serve the Lord, what are you going to do? You're going to present your body a living sacrifice. You know how you do that? You do that 24-7. You do that in everything you do. You do it in your music. You do it in your preaching. You do it on your job. You do it on your in, in, out, of, out of the ball field. You do it on the recreation field. You do it surfing out on the, on, on the ocean. You do it kayaking. You do it everywhere you go. Everything is the service. And by the way, that word service, if you look over in Hebrews chapter 8, when he talked about the worshiping in the temple, he called it the divine service. You know why people call the Sunday morning preaching service a service? They call it the worship service because that word service in the Bible is used to describe how God was worshipped by His people. You know how you demonstrate the worth of God in your life? You present your body a living sacrifice. That's the point. Godward in your life, being an ambassador, first thing is I'm presenting my, my body a living sacrifice. I'm literally going to live in the reality of who I am. And I'm going to use my talents and my skills and my abilities and my wisdom and understanding in life, and I'm going to use it to demonstrate the value and the worth that I find in Him. Paul said, I did it with all humility of mind. I love that. You know how you have humility of mind? You've been embarrassed. <laughs> Thought you were smart, somebody came along smarter than you. Joe said no. <laughs> he doesn't hang around with smart people, so he's not worried about it. <laughs> no, soon put you in your place, but I see not here, so. He just experienced it just now. Yeah, he just experienced it. Okay. <laughs> Humility of mind, lowliness and meekness of mind. When you realize somebody else is smarter than you, it's easy to be humble. Paul said, I serve with humility of mind. He's in essence saying, I serve understanding he's right and I'm not. He's the boss and I'm not. His word is true and dependable, so I'm going to trust him. I'm going to take my mind and submit it to him. Now that's a fascinating thing. Some of the guys yesterday were asking me about some studies I did some time ago about about the Bible and and about the the look, look with me at Psalm 136. There's a fascinating connection in the scripture in God's word with with our uh, you get Proverbs 3 in one hand and uh, Psalm 136 139 I'm sorry yeah 139 Psalm, Psalm 139, Proverbs chapter number uh, number three. You know, Jesus said, "You worship God as a spirit, and then to worship Him must worship Him in what spirit and truth." So, how do you worship God in spirit and truth? John chapter six, verse six to three. Jesus said, "The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they're life." So if I'm going to worship Him in spirit, how am I going to worship Him? I'm going to worship Him with the words that are spirit and life. That's His Word. If I'm going to worship Him in spirit and in truth, Jesus said in John 6, 17, 17, Sanctify them by Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. 
So to worship God in spirit and truth will be to worship God in line with what His Word teaches me about what His thinking is. <laughs> Saying it's true, I have the humility of mind to say I value His opinion more than my opinion. And when people see you in your life, making decisions and living your life based upon what you see the truth of God's Word saying. You say, I value His thinking, His opinion. I cherish what He thinks. I value Him more than anything else. Who did you just demonstrate as the most valuable person in your life? The most worthy person in your life? The one you worship? See how that works? Worshiping God in spirit and truth it has nothing to do with how you feel. You can feel happy at a football game. You know, last Sunday night, you guys watched the Super Bowl. I go to church on Sunday nights. So I didn't see it. But everybody, you get that, you get that spirit. Well, you can go down to the youth rally down here and get the same spirit. It's a nice feeling. I'm not against the feeling. The point is, worshiping God in spirit and truth isn't worshiping God in spirit, His Word. Worshiping truth, His Word. So when you worship God, it's going to always come back to His Word. Now, look with me at Psalm 139. 139. David was talking. And he says, verse 15, My substance was not hid from, thy, from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. When God made man, I said yesterday, uh, when God made Adam, formed him out of the dust of the earth, he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. God literally created something in secret down inside of that physical body. When I, his soul, was made in secret, and you couldn't see it, you only knew it because God told you about it. Verse 16, mine eye, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Notice how he talks about that. Before He said, before my members, the parts of my body, were, were grown and fashioned out, they're still unperfect. In thy book all my members were written which in continuance as I grow from that little little little, little, little bitty conceived um, fetus there, little baby, I grow, but the, my, the color of my eyes was already there. The color of my hair was already there. The fact that I have five fingers and five fingers and two hands and two arms, all of that was already there. It was already written in thy book. All my members. Now, until the 1980s, you didn't really understand what that verse talking about. Now we understand there is a book of DNA in your genetic structure at conception when the 23 chromosomes from dad and the 23 chromosomes from mom meet together and form that new little child those 46 chromosomes that become you, in that moment, your members were there. Written in that book of DNA. And everything that happened, they literally are reading DNA now. DNA has letters. Don't study it. It's fascinating. The letters make sentences. They used to think it was just a bunch of junk. That's because they didn't understand it. Now they don't say it's junk. They just say it's part of it we hadn't translated yet. The letters make words. The words make sentences. And the sentences have punctuation and make paragraphs. <laughs> and it's, a, it's the most fascinating thing. I can remember Bill Clinton when he was president when the Human Genome uh, Project came to the White House and gave him a whole day's long, uh, you know, he was an intellectually curious guy. He spent the whole, he put the whole world on hold and spent the whole day listening to this stuff. He came out in the evening and gave a report on it. That's when I first came, became aware of it. I started reading about it. And it's the most fascinating thing. God literally has written a book of your life in that moment in your DNA. Proverbs, now hold your hand and come with me to Proverbs chapter 3. 
Because here's the part of it that, that, that gets me wound up. And I'm talking to you about why you ought to have humility of mind when you deal with God's Word. Proverbs 3, verse 19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding he hath established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths were, bro were broken up and the clouds dropped down. When God created, made creation, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding, he took it and by, by his wisdom, his knowledge, and understanding, he made creation. The reason you are who you are, the way you function, who you are, why your DNA works the way it does is because God took his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding, and put it together. And then when he put man in the earth, he said, go out and subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Go out and harness the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding I put in creation. They did a thing yesterday about the, what kind of berries were those? Berry and berries. <laughs> <laughs> Who kind of berries? Marion berries. Marion berries. That's, he's the mayor of D.C., wasn't he? <laughs> That's as close as I can get to that. I like peaches, but I'll, I'll try some will come out in October. You have some out, and I'll, I'll, I'll check them out. <laughs> but you see that, with, what are you doing? You're taking, Adam was to be an entrepreneur of creation, and to create, to take what God had given him, and then enhance it, and create it, and make it more exceedingly good. That's part of the genius, the creative genius he gave to man, put in creation. In you. He wrote a book in your DNA. Now, God wrote another book. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. What book is that? That's your Bible, right? The, 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 the DNA of your spiritual life is in the Bible. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the DNA of the Christ life is where? It's in the Word of God. He takes the Word of God, Spirit of God, puts it in you, and makes spiritual life in you out of His DNA, the Word. So the DNA of your spiritual life comes out of God's Word, like the DNA of your physical life comes out of creation. If I, There's a comparison between the DNA in your creation and the DNA in God's Word. If if you if I stand here, up, up the middle of my back is a backbone. We call it the spine. It divides my body into two parts. Two equal parts. Equal ribs on each side, that kind of thing. There are 33 bones in, my, in, in your spine. Man, woman, whoever you are, there are 33 bones. Your spine divides your body in the two parts. Your Bible can be divided into two parts. Some people call it Old Testament, New Testament. We know better. What would it really be? Prophecy and mystery. There are 1,189 chapters in the King James Bible. Now, if you divide that by two, two going to that five times, that's 10, 18, two going to that nine times, nine of nine is 18, and then you have nine, two going to that four times. So, half of that would be 494 and a half. Well, you can't have half a chapter. So what you do is you need to find the 400, the 595th chapter in the Bible, that's going to be the middle chapter. That's going to be the spine of your Bible. So turn with me to the 595th chapter of the Bible. Which is? Oh, you don't know what that is? Okay. <laughs> Psalm 117. Psalm 117. Psalm 117. Which Bible? <laughs> My Bible, your Bible, King James Bible, okay. God's Word. It'd be different in a different Bible. Uh, no, they have the same chapter numbers. Yep. They don't have the same verse numbers, but they have the same chapters. Okay. Psalm 117, middle chapter of the Bible. Here's the spine of the Bible. How many verses in that? <laughs> What's your spine? Divide your Bible? You divide you, you into it? Two, two verses. If you, if you spent just a minute counting the words in those two verses, you know how many words there are? 
33. 33 words. No, 33 words. How many bones in your spine? 118. 117. Right there. 33. Yeah. That's verse. I'm talking about chapter. Okay. Now that's just, you say, hmm, where'd that come from? What do you make of that, Brother Rick? I just make out that that's the middle chapter. The spine chapter of my Bible just happens to have two verses, like the spine, your, your body divided into two by the spine, and it has 33 verse, ver, words in it, like your spine has 33 words. You say, what does that mean? That just means it's the middle chapter. Two divisions, 33, but ain't it interesting? You have 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes, you add those two together and you have 46 and that makes a new person, right? Come back with me to Genesis chapter number two. Genesis chapter two. Now, I'm just doing a couple of these, there's a dozen of these things we can do, I, it's time to quit already. I'm not gonna quit, but it's, it's <laughs> quite yet. I'm just trying to make you understand what Paul talks about humility of mind. You're not you're not being unwise to trust God's word. Twenty-three chromosomes, twenty-three chromosomes equals a new child. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. And Adam said, Now is this bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We're going to be one flesh. 23, 23 is going to become 46. We're going to be one flesh, and you're one flesh in your children. If you, counted, if you counted the words in the quotation that Adam just gave you, you know how many words you'd find in the quotation? In the verse that first describes 23 and 23 becoming 46, it just happens to be describing it with 46 words. Now that's just a coincidence, I know, but it's just fascinating. And it'll only happen in the King James Bible, by the way. If you start reading in Genesis chapter 3 and Satan shows up and he says, Yea, hath God said, you know the quotation? If you wanted to count everything Satan said, the quotes of Satan in chapter 3, when he says things like, Thou shalt not surely die and so forth, if you counted the words that Satan says to Eve in order to corrupt the seed line, you know how many words that would be? 40. 46. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at me like, what does that mean? That means, <laughs> that means there were 46 words. <laughs> My point to you is God said, I got a book. I put wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in the creation and the way you are created, and I put some life in a book and the spiritual DNA of life in Christ Jesus is in that book. It's not in a religion. It's not in a church doctrine. It's not in rites and ceremonies and correctnesses and things that I go do and I figure out how to do. God put it in His Word. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And the spiritual life of God, that the, the Spirit of God wrote the Word, the spiritual life of the Spirit of God in His Word, when you, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, it works effectually in you that believe. It's your faith resting in the truth of what God's Word rightly divided said. Not God's Word to Israel, not God's Word about somebody else, but God's Word about us as members of the church, the body of Christ. When your faith rests in that Word, that Word becomes life to you. Becomes the life of Christ working in you. And when Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, He's saying, I cherish Him. I value Him. 
I esteem Him more than everything else. And in the choices that I make, and the decisions that I make, and the path that I follow in my life, I demonstrate my value of Him by trusting His Word. And when decisions have to be made, choices have to be made, I want to be His will. And I'm going to serve Him with humility of mind. I'm going to say, Your will, not my will be done. Galatians 2, He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you realize that Jesus Christ had faith? You say, he's God. Sure he was. He said, I, I'm, I'm going to lay down my life. No man takes my life from me. I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to take it up. This commandment I received from my Father. Paul said he was obedient unto death. Obedient to who? His father. Hebrews 10, he says, A volume, a volume, a book is written to me. I come, Lord, I come to do thy will. O oh, Father. You remember that verse he said, you ladies all know this verse. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? He loved the church according to the will of his father. So when he says, I live my life by the faith of I'm going to live my life exactly like he lived. He lived his life. He, in the garden, he says, nevertheless, I mean, if, if let this cup pass, that'd be good. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I'm going to cherish the will of my Father above everything else. And even when my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even when my flesh is weak. He said, forget that. The Father's will is the issue. That's the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live my life exactly the way He lived His life. If we suffer with Him, if I walk as He walked, in dependence on the will and the word of my Father. That's what it is to, be, to serve with humility of mind. That's what it is to be an ambassador. It starts there. If you go back to Acts 20 and you read through it, you'll see how Paul talks about the church. He teaches them. Lost people, he preached the gospel to them. When he came to himself, he was willing to, no matter what happened, willing to take it, sacrifice it. But it all begins with the commitment to doing the will of the Father as it's revealed in his word. Stop me going off and saying, Oh God, show me your will and looking for... You know what you find in circumstances? <laughs> you find the CNS gang, and they, and they just beat the snot out of you. That's why he says in Acts 20, in that verse he says, with tears, <laughs> serving the Lord with tears and many temptations that lie away with me of the Jews. You know what happens in life? You know the CNS gang. Situations, circumstances and situations come up. And they always do, don't they? And they just want to, they gang up on you and beat you up. You get drive by shot at with them all the time. And in spite of all that, he said, what am I doing? I'm going to serve the Lord with humility of mind. In spite of the tears, the temptations, everything in my all that, I'm, I got one focus. You see, there's a purpose that you can go from here and live. Because you have a gospel you can believe, a book you can trust, a study you can understand, and a life you can live. It allows you to fulfill a purpose of being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. When you go back home, Go back home with a purpose. If not just saying, Ooh, we had a good time at the Bible class. Who's playing ball tonight? I don't mind you. Know, I'm not saying don't watch the ball team. That's, that's, that's your business. In my house, you watch 
short ball teams and short you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you can watch any of them as long as a certain one is winning. <laughs> and enjoy it. But the point, my point is that the purpose, the task, what are we doing with, with, with the information? You let it be life. You let it be the life that God designed it to be, that he intended it to be, that he chose it to be. And you take it, and you let it be what, what lives in you and out through you for his glory. You let that life that's, that, that's, uh, that's ours in Christ Jesus be the life that God intended it to be. Let me just finish with one verse, Romans chapter number 1. Verse number 15. Romans 1 verse 14. For I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbaric, both to the wise and the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that have grown also. I think that's the greatest verse on, 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 to describe Paul's motivation. What is it that kept Paul going? As much as in me is, I'm ready. His ministry, his life, was simply the outflow of the inflow of the love and grace of God. He got that in. And when he got it in him to the point, it had to come out of it. <clears throat> Have you ever heard, heard my illustration about bounding? How many of you know that? About what? <clears throat> bounding. Some of you do. Okay. Those of you that do, just hang on for a minute. <laughs> that idea of as much as in me, I'm ready, it's just going to come out. Years ago when I was in Alabama, I used to go down and preach on the street. It's hot in Alabama in the summertime. And I was down in front of Thompson's drug store one day preaching, and after you preach in the open air a little while, your throat gets raspy. And I went inside, it's hot, I went inside to get in the air conditioning, frankly. And I, I went over and bought a lemonade, because lemonade helps soothe your throat. So I'm over here by the, by the, by the Coke rack, and, and, and the, 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 where the Cokes are, and I, and I had the lemonade. I'm standing there just kind of nursing it and trying to cool off a little bit. And I watched at the door, and, and, a, and an old farmer, Alabama farmer, came in. He's got on his overalls, galluses, we call them. And he's a real, he's a real short enough country boy. He didn't have a shirt on underneath him. He just got the galluses, and you know what overalls are. And he's, he's, he's hot, his, the side flaps are open. And he coming in, and I could see when he came in on his face, he looked distressed. And he came in, and he comes over to where I'm at by the... Um, I said, where the drinks were, and he, and he got a, and you young folk can't appreciate this, but he got a, a you, you guys remember the, a 16 ounce Coke in a glass bottle? You remember how good they were? Ice cold, that glass bottle, all oh, those things were good. He, he got the thing, and you know, you, you take your thumb and flip the top off of it. And then he walks over here and he goes over to the Alka-Seltzer rack. <laughs> and he gets this little pack of two Alka-Seltzers. And I'm watching, because it's curious. And he took those Alka-Seltzers and, and he puts them, they took that coat and went, <laughs> in one doll, 60 pounds, right now. And no sooner than he got it all down, <laughs> he, it dawned on him this was not a good point. So just like a, a blur, he's out the door. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna go see what happened. So I followed him out the door. And that dear guy, poor fella, he was hanging on a parking meter. You know? 
like this. And there was a white thumb coming out of his mouth, coming out of his ear, coming out of his nose. Looked like it was coming out of his ears. I don't know what just he was just, you know what he was just gushing out of him. You know what he was doing? He was abounding. <laughs> It's in him. It's going to come out no matter what he wanted to do. As much as in me is, I'm ready. You see, when you have the day when your Christian life doesn't, you think, I just, it, it ain't working. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted, built up in him, establishing the faith as you've been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. It's not you getting down and saying, Lord, fill me, hit me, zap me. <laughs> it's not running down to try to, I'm going to rededicate. Just get your nose back in that book. Get that humility of mind back that says, all to Jesus, I surrender. He's everything. Him. He's the issue. And then a little, spend a little time going over in your mind, remembering, reminding yourself of who it is God's made you in Christ. Now when you know you need that, convincing you to write the right the word will be a done deal. When you go home, Go home abounding, will you? <laughs> Father, we thank you this morning for life in Christ Jesus. And I pray if there's someone here this morning in this little meeting that's never really experienced the life that's in Christ by simply trusting you, resting exclusively in the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Savior He died and rose again for them to be. This will be a time when that choice will be made. The quietness and stillness of their heart. For those of us that do know you, do rejoice in the riches of your grace to us in Christ. I pray this might be a time that encourages us to abound therein with thanksgiving. In Christ's name.